What is up guys and welcome to another episode of Structure Archer Reviews. In this episode we will be covering five moderately priced hunting bows. So before we even start, what do I mean by moderately priced? To me, entry level bows are going to be those bows that aren't toys, but don't meet the standard that you'd expect from a major manufacturer. Entry level bows that you can get at your local big box store, a lot of the times they are sold as a package with a cheap set of typical accessories. Sight, quiver, arrow rest, stuff like that. You can typically find these around the $300 to $500 range. When we step up into the moderately priced range, things start to get serious. While these bows don't have all the bells and whistles that you'd get in a flagship bow, they are going to be serious pieces of equipment that are capable of a lifetime of shooting. I think this range really represents the best value in archery. You're probably going to get 90% of the flagship bow's features for only 70% of the cost. So if it's in your budget, why would you consider these moderately priced bows over cheaper bows? Most people will say that these more expensive bows are a lot more accurate. But we've already proven that wrong. If you haven't seen it, check out my video where in less than a week, I took a $300 package bow and tuned it to where I was almost shooting perfect scores. So while these moderately priced bows should have a better back wall and make it a little bit easier to be more accurate, it's not as much as people would expect. What you're really spending the extra money on in these bows is reliability. You're paying for higher quality components. Let me give you the simplest example. Strings. Strings are easily the greatest risk for accuracy. Their performance can be impacted by temperature, humidity, and wear. And using cheap string material is a real easy way for companies to save money, and most people will never realize. A high quality set of strings and cables will cost you around $120. When you step up from an entry level bow to a moderately priced bow, you should expect that the bows are going to come with a higher quality string. And having those from the start will save you from a bunch of tuning headaches. So let's introduce the bows. We'll be taking a look at the Hoy Powermax, the PSE Drive 3B, the Mission MXR, the Bowtech Convergence, and the Quest Thrive. We aren't going to go too in-depth into these bows because it would take way too long and it would just be plain boring, so we'll be focusing on the five major reasons why you would pick one bow over another. Draw force curve, speed, vibration, grip, and special features. Before we get started, I just want to give a quick thank you to Bear Creek Archery in Englewood, Colorado for providing these bows. I always preach that your local shop is the place to go and if you're really wanting to get into archery. Big box stores have gone better, but they'll never match the level of service and help that you'll get from your local shop. And when you're talking about these higher dollar bows, you need to make sure that you're working with someone that can maximize your investment. So if you're in the market for a bow, I'd recommend that you do yourself a favor and find the highest quality local shop that you can. For me in the Denver area, that's Bear Creek. So make sure to go stop by or check them out at bearcreekarchery.com. Last thing, if you're wanting to improve your archery, I've been providing online coaching to both bow hunters and competitive archers. It's an easy way to improve your game on your schedule. We use video review and one-on-one -on -one conversations to work on your form, tuning, mental game, and equipment choices. Right now, I'm offering a free lesson for anybody who's ready to do the work. You can find out more information at my website, strongstarchery.com, which will be down in the description. Okay, back to the bows. Let's go over the basic specs first. Most of these bows fall into the typical dimensions for a hunting bow with 30 to 31 inches axle to axle and a seven inch brace height. The two outliers would be the Quest Thrive, which had a 34 and a quarter inch axle to axle, and the Hoyt Power Max, which had a slightly shorter brace height. Weight-wise, they all come in right about four pounds. There are slight differences, but I weighed all of these without accessories, so your total weight will depend on how you outfit your bow. We're going to talk about speeds later, but here are the manufacturer's listed values. Remember that there are different ways to measure speed. There's ATA and IBO, so you can't always compare the values the manufacturers give you. Besides, speed seems to be such a huge selling point for a lot of people. It's always good to check third-party reviews where you know that the comparisons are apples to apples. The last specs that you need to consider are fitment. All of these have basically the same specs. They all max out at 70 pounds, but if you're running a 30 plus inch draw length, you might run into some limitations. Now let's get back to those five major reasons why you would pick one bow over another. And we'll start by looking at the draw force curves. Quick review, a draw force curve is the graph of the pressure you feel as you draw back the bow. So as you pull, the poundage rises and you can see that here on the graph. The bow then peaks draw weight for a while and then finally decreases into the valley. This is the let off that we associate with compound bows. It reduces your holding weight so that you don't fatigue as fast. Let's take a look at the curves. We'll start with the Mission MXR. I would consider this a very neutral curve. What do I mean by that? I evaluate the curves based on the two slopes. The MXR is very symmetrical. 
the initial part of the draw isn't too aggressive, and the valley towards the end of the draw cycle isn't too steep either. The steeper either of these angles are, the more quickly the pressure builds and the harder it is to control. We'll use the MXR as a standard to compare these other bows to. Now let's compare this to the Hoyt Powermax. If I show you just the Powermax's curve, it looks similar to the MXR, but let's overlay the two. You can see that two things are happening here. The Hoyt builds power slower in the beginning of the draw, but then if you look at the end of the draw, you can see that it makes it up for this by having a steeper valley. I think it's easy to understand how this variance in the beginning will feel. It will just be easier to start initiating the draw. But how will this valley impact you? Well, there are two things to think about. Number one is that you're going to be spending more effort as you get close to the wall. So if you're not comfortable with the draw weight, you might be coming in a little bit hot, and that can lead to bouncing off the wall, which causes movement, which is always bad. The other thing that you have to think about is what will happen if you let down or relax off the wall. It's steeper valley is going to want to accelerate faster and take off on you. I'm not saying this is a problem, but it's something to consider. Next, let's look at the Bowtech Converge. Can you see what's happening here? Let's put the Mission MXR data back up. Look at the valley on the Converge, it's huge. These bows are almost identical at the beginning of the draw. But the Bowtech gives you a valley that's very, very slow and smooth. So you can creep into the wall nice and slow if you want to. This creates an easily controlled draw, but it loses that potential power. Again, I'm not saying this is a good thing or a bad thing. It completely depends on how you shoot and what's best for your style. Let's go the opposite direction now. This is the PSD Drive 3B. When we take a look at the curve, we can see instantly the steep slope in the beginning. Let's overlay the MXR again. You can see that the PSC builds power early, but does give you a softer approach into the wall. This bow is the most aggressive out of the group within the first several inches of the draw. And I think that this is an important thing to consider. You're definitely generating more power and speed because of this, but when I think of the entire draw cycle, I think those first few inches can be the most difficult. If you think about it, your arm is fully extended and your shoulder could be pushed out a little bit depending on your form. I've worked with a couple of archers who've had shoulder injuries in the past, so I just wanted to raise this as something to consider. Again, by itself, it's not a bad thing, but you have to look at it in the context of how you shoot and what you're wanting to gain. The last bow that we need to graph out is the Quest Thrive, which is very rounded on the edges. When I bring up the MXR for comparison, do you remember which curve this is like? Let's take a look at the Quest side by side with the Hoyt. Look how similar these are. You can see that the Quest shaves off a little bit of power from the front end and gains it right back as it transitions into the valley, but they're extremely similar. I think the point here is that nobody that's trying out these bows at a shop is going to tell the difference, but I do think when you're shopping for a bow, you should go into it knowing what you want. If you know that you want a bow that has power in the front or on the back of the curve, then you'll be more likely to be tuned into these differences and you'll have more luck in selecting the bow that's right for you. So now that we've reviewed the power curves, let's see how fast these bows tested out. I set all the bows to 29 inches, 68 pounds, and I used my 450 grain hunting arrows. Quick side note, one of the best things about archery are the people you meet. Last year during my elk hunt, I had a little incident with my hunting arrows. It was my fault, not the arrow's fault, but regardless, I was lucky because I was able to borrow some arrows from a guy named Mike Hosgood, and it saved my hunt. So a quick shout out to Mike, thank you, I really do appreciate it. This kind of thing is what makes archery a great sport. Okay, back to speed. Let's just cut to the numbers. You can see there that the PSC Drive gave the fastest results at 280 feet per second. The Quest and the Hoyt were right there with it. The Mission and the Bowtech came in slowest down around the 270 feet per second mark. Remember how the Bowtech had that huge valley that goes softly into the wall? That's the result of that. Now besides arguing over what brand is best, speed is one of the most overly debated things in archery. Let's take a look at what this 10 feet per second gap or difference really means. There are several advantages that people want to get from a faster bow. One is simply that the arrow gets there faster and there's less of a chance that the target is going to jump out of the way. Another advantage that people want to get from higher speeds is a flatter trajectory. This means that if they are wrong about judging the distance, then they're not going to miss by as much as they would if they shot with a slower bow. Let's take a quick look at the math on this. Let's say you have a target 45 yards away and you're using your Bowtech Converge at 270 feet per second. And I also let you borrow my hunting arrows, which is 450 grains. Now let's say you don't know that the target is 45 yards away. You think it's only 40 yards away. So you're going to be aiming true, but your distance is five yards short. So your arrow is going to be low, but where do you think this arrow is going to hit? Let's take a look. 
So that's what being off by five yards will do to your shot. Now let's say that after you miss, your buddy hands you his brand new PSE Drive 3B, which we know shoots 10 feet per second faster. We're going to assume that you haven't figured out that you were five yards short yet. So you're going to aim the same spot. Where do you think this next shot is going to hit? Well, it's going to hit here. The difference in arrow impact between a 270 and a 280 feet per second bow with 450 grain arrows at 45 yards is about a half of an inch. That's it. Now this will vary based on what arrows you use, how they're fletched, and how well your bow's tuned and all of that, but I think that you see the point. 10 feet per second isn't going to salvage a bad shot. Even 20 or 30 feet per second really isn't going to help you here. So while speed is the best indicator of how much power a bow is producing, when it comes to hits and misses, it's not as important of a factor as some other things. You shouldn't risk discomfort and inaccuracy by getting a more aggressive bow just to get a few more feet per second. Oh, and you might think that the drop doesn't change that much, but the slower arrow gives the deer more time to duck and run. The extra amount of time that the animal would have is 0.02 seconds. That's two hundredths of a second, not two tenths, two hundredths. By the time the faster arrow makes contact, the slower arrow will only be a little over a yard behind it. So unless you're shooting at a deer that's straight from the matrix, I wouldn't worry about it. With all of this power pushing these arrows out at crazy speeds, all this extra energy that didn't go into the arrow needs to go somewhere. We experience this as sound in vibration. So let's break down the vibration measurements that I recorded. As we can tell, the Hoyt Mission and PSC are very similar in vibration measurements when it comes to amplitude. When we look into duration and dissipation of the vibration, all of the bows are close to the same, other than the Quest Thrive. It has repeated vibrations for much longer than any other bow. I've never seen anything like this before, and it was consistent for every single test with this bow. Even though it struggles with vibration dissipation, it does have the smallest amplitude, which would suggest that it's the quietest bow. Bowtech Convergence would get second, and the rest of the bows are ordered based on total size of the vibrations. This would be the Mission, Hoyt, and then the PSE. Vibration should not be a deal breaker because these are just the measurements from the stock bows. This is not the end all be all. In the end, you could add dampeners to your bow, so this measurement is the starting line, not the finishing line. But let's step away from vibration and power and let's focus purely on the grip. I want to talk about the shape, thickness, angle, everything. The grip is extremely important. I'd personally say it's one of the top most important pieces of the bow. I say this because it's one of the few places we actually contact the bow. So let's classify the different types of factors of a grip. First is the shape of the grip, whether it's straight or contoured. A contoured grip is great for comfort because it disperses all of that pressure throughout your hand. This allows your hand to be more relaxed and it just feels more comfortable. A straight grip doesn't give you this comfort, but the lack of surface area makes it less likely that you'll torque the bow. The more surface area on your hand, the more leverage you'll have and the easier it will be to torque. Now let's cover the two other factors which are a flat or a rounded platform. Let's give you a few examples so you can determine these factors for yourself in the future. A good example of a contoured grip would be a Hoyt RX3 grip. You can also notice that the platform of the grip has a flat landing area. This grip would be in the contoured flat category. Now let's look at the Prime Logic, which is a straight grip. It has a rounded platform, so it would be in the straight rounded category. Now that we understand all the different types of grips, let's categorize all five of the bows. First, we'll take a look at the Hoyt Powermax, which is very similar to the usual Hoyt bow hunting grips. They come with a contoured flat platform grip. The flat part is shaped differently with more of a triangle shape, but I still count this as flat. The PSC Drive 3B comes with a straight flat platform grip. This is very similar to the competition bow grips that I use. The bow to converge seems to be more of a hybrid because it is slightly contoured, but also straight. I personally classify it as a contoured flat platform grip because it is not perfectly straight. The Mission MXR is actually a straight round style grip. The negative of having a fully rounded platform is that it doesn't provide additional stability to resist any side pressure. Finally, the Quest Thrive is also a straight rounded grip. There is a slight flat area, but it's too small to be classified as a flat platform grip. Before we wrap up grip, let's quickly cover grip angle. This is a fairly underrated factor because it wouldn't seem to have a large effect on performance. The problem that people actually run into is draw length issues and how a change in grip angle can mess with what we're used to. Here are the grip angles for these bows. As you can tell, four to five of the bows have a 17 to 18 degree grip angle and the Mission MXR is the only outlier at 10 and a half degrees. 
So pay attention to the grip angle when testing out these bows, especially if it's noticeably different from what you're used to. Let's move forward into additional features. What makes these bows special? The first thing that quickly grabbed my attention was the limb stops in both the Bowtech Convergence and the Quest Thrive. Limb stops are not the most common in the archery industry, but I think it can be a very beneficial addition for many archers. Cable and limb stops are the components that create the wall, and as you can probably guess, limb stops are a lot more solid than cable stops. This can be a positive or a negative for some people, so make sure to take this into consideration when testing the Convergence and the Thrive. When it comes to features, the Quest wins this category, but remember that it's also the most expensive bow it's kind of getting closer to the higher priced category of bows. The Quest Thrive also seems to come with a few more cool add-ons like their Flexus AR system. This cable guard flexes in as you draw the bow to help reduce natural bow torque and cam lean. As soon as you shoot, it moves out of the way so there is no contact with the arrow. This cable guard is also the only one in this comparison that uses cable rollers. This helps prevent wear and tear on your cables over time and helps create a smoother draw. One super convenient feature is the Thrive comes with all of the mods. You don't need to pay even more money every time you're looking to get a new mod. This can be extremely beneficial if you're still looking to find your perfect draw length and need some room to play. Quest prides themselves with their 82X aluminum that is supposed to be super rigid and stiff. This might play a part in how quiet this bow is, but I'm not an engineer. This Thrive was also the only bow in the comparison to have metal limb pockets. So as you can tell, the Quest has a lot of extra features. This is just due to the higher price and extra budget of the bow. The Thrive comes with metal limb pockets while the rest of the bows in this comparison have their limb pockets made of plastic. The plastic that the other brands use seem to be durable and tough, but I can't promise that over time. Speaking of plastic, a not so positive addition to the Bowtech Convergence was its plastic mods. I really was not happy to see plastic mods on a mid-priced bow. You usually see this on entry level bows, so this really surprised me. It's not crappy plastic in any way, but again, I can't promise that its quality will continue over multiple years of usage. All of these features are just the cherry on top. You shouldn't be picking your bow based on extra features. If anything, use it as a tiebreaker. You should base your choices on grip, draw force curve, vibration, and other factors that align with what you're looking for. In the end, what you need to do is get out there and try these bows out for yourself. I can't tell you what bow is going to be best for you, because everybody has their own personal preferences and needs. So once we get done wrapping this up, get up and get your hands on these bows. Wait, subscribe, leave a like, and then you can go out and try these bows. All right, before we summarize everything that we've learned, if you're wanting to improve your form or get ready for hunting season, remember that I'm providing one-on-one -on -one coaching online. I don't make any money from these videos, so this is how I pay for archery tournaments and college and things like that. The first session is free, so you can try it out. There's no obligation. If you're interested, just reach out to me at strongshotarchery.com. Moving forward, let's piece this all together. First, we'll cover the Hoyt Powermax. I could sum this up to a really solid average Joe bow. It is the second most expensive bow out of the group at $699, but it comes with the typical features that you'd expect from a high-end manufacturer. It has a very neutral draw cycle, which proves an above average speed of 277 feet per second. With all of this power, the vibration measurements for the Powermax are extremely similar to the rest of the bows. It shares a lot of the same qualities of the other bows, like plastic limb pockets, a slider cable guard, and several of the specs. It also carries a contoured flat platform grip which is typical of other Hoyt bows. Let's take a look at the PSC Derive 3B. This is the most aggressive bow in the comparison. It has a super sharp beginning slope which gives the bow its speed of 280 feet per second. Even with the extra power, the vibration is very consistent with the other bows. I would classify this as the speed bow of this comparison. I would also like to add that this bow had the best string serving job that I've ever seen. The center serving's thickness was consistent within one thousandth of an inch. I was super impressed. Next, the Mission MXR. This is the cheapest bow and also, I would say, the most neutral draw cycle of this group. It's super symmetrical and isn't close to being aggressive on either side of the draw curve. The bow I tested came with the speed mods, but the rock mods that usually come with this bow are probably a bit softer. This gives the bow a vibration profile that is very similar to the majority of the group. One piece that I don't necessarily prefer is the rounded platform grip. This can make it easy to torque and the majority of people don't tend to like this style grip. I would classify this bow as more of the best bang for your buck bow. It meets almost all of the bows when it comes to features and it's the cheapest bow of the group. If your budget is on the lower end of this comparison and you're willing to give up a few of the features, this bow could be a good choice. The Bowtech Converge has to be the smoothest bow in the group with such a relaxed draw cycle. 
This results in giving it the slowest speed, but as we've learned, the 10 feet per second difference between the Bowtech and the fastest bow, the PSC, makes very little difference. Even though this power difference doesn't make a lot of difference in the outcome, it does make a difference in the sound and vibration of the bow. The Converge has the second smallest vibration measurement in the entire group. One piece that I honestly don't like about this bow is the plastic mods. This most likely won't affect anything, but it's not something I'm confident in. I would classify this bow as the smooth bow in this comparison. If you prefer a smoother draw cycle or you've had a shoulder injury in the past, this would make a great bow choice. With its relaxed draw cycle, it can really take some stress off your arm and shoulder and make the draw weight feel a lot lighter. Keep in mind that this bow also comes with limb stops, which creates a really solid wall. This could be a benefit or a negative depending on your preference, so make sure you think about it when testing out this bow. Last but not least, the Quest Thrive. This bow is packed with features. From the 82X aluminum riser to the Flexus AR system, this is the most expensive bow in the review, coming in at $749. It has a smoother, more relaxed draw force curve, and the bow has the smallest vibration measurement of the group. Though the vibration does last for a while, the total amount of vibration created is super small. Just like the Bowtech Converge, this bow comes with limb stops for a tough wall. Make sure to keep this in mind when trying out this bow. With the price being the highest, this gives Quest the room to provide the most reliable components like the metal limb pockets and the roller cable guard. This bow also comes with all the mods so you don't have to buy another mod every time you'd like to try a different length. I'd classify this bow as the flagship bow in this comparison. I say this because of the price and the features that are provided. If you're looking for a bow with quality and reliable components with great features, this would be a good choice to test. Now that you understand what these bows are going to do for you, stop watching these reviews and get out there and test these bows. This is all about understanding what you want in a bow. If you don't have the experience yet to know what you want, try out these bows and keep these factors in mind. Soon enough, you'll learn what will be best for you. Nobody, including me, can tell you what bow is going to be right for you. So make sure to subscribe, leave a like, share with a buddy if you can. It's just the easiest way to help support these videos. Anyways, I hope this video helped you out. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, or concerns down below. Or if you want to email me separately, that will be in, in the description. And good luck on testing out these bows, and I'll see you in the next one. See ya.